Okay, so thank you everyone for, for coming today uh, to our Open Secrets um, presentation about the uh, ongoing integration of lobbying uh, data and the kinds of fruits that that is starting to bear. Uh, so uh, I want to um, introduce my fellow speakers today. My name is Pete Quist, uh, and I am the Deputy Research Director at Open Secrets uh, and coming from the National Institute on Money and Politics, uh, where I have been working since 2008. Uh, and primarily focused on state uh, campaign finance uh, and lobbying and elections work. Um, and Dan, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, uh, my name is Dan Aubel. I'm a senior researcher at Open Secrets. And I've been with Open Secrets and previously Center for Responsive Politics for about 15 years, uh, working on everything from political action committees to individual donors, the personal investments of Congress. Uh, and then for the last eight or 10 years, I've been focused on lobbying and revolving door issues. Brendan? Hi, I'm uh, Brendan Glavin. I'm a senior data analyst at Open Secrets. Um, I started working in uh, money politics in 2001 with the Campaign Finance Institute. And then uh, later with the National Institute on Money and Politics when uh, CFI became part of that institute. Um, over that time, I've worked in many different areas in the money and politics space, but uh, the reason uh, I'm here today is my most recent work has been investigating and cataloging the workings of lobbying disclosure at the state level. Um, and the product of that uh, being a, a ranking a scorecard of state lobbying disclosure um, that I'll be uh, I'll be discussing the details of that uh, a little bit later. So I want to go over uh, what we're here to talk about today. Uh, so as we've continued to uh, integrate federal and state lobbying data from the merger of the Center for Responsive Politics and the National Institute on Money and pa State Politics last year, uh, we are uh, setting the stage for additional integrated analysis of uh, lobbying data. And earlier this month, uh, we published a couple of reports looking at um, broad trends uh, and patterns in federal and state lobbying uh, spending and how uh, those compare or differ. Um, the first report examined uh, information in uh, 2020 and 2019 and was published on June 2nd. Uh, and the second report uh, examined uh, was a follow up that examined this in. Uh, similar patterns and trends in 2021 and how those continued. Uh, following that, we will look at uh, disclosure practices, the work that Brendan referenced. Uh, he's been doing a lot of examinations about uh, what is reported in lobbying. Uh, and that has a big impact, of course, uh, in our ability to see and measure uh, efforts to impact public policy uh, through this process. And then we'll talk about future goals and potential research uh, that are made possible uh, through our integrated federal lobbying uh, database. Uh, so just to sort of set the stage here, uh, this is all coming around because of the merger last year before between the Center for Responsive Politics and the National Institute on Money and Politics. Uh, most of you are familiar with both or we're familiar with both uh, to form the organization Open Secrets. Uh, this was a, a fantastic merger. Uh, these two organizations had been working on uh, similar uh, kinds of work in different areas uh, for many years, decades actually, uh, and had the shared mission of taking money and politics information and making that available and digestible for members of the public, including uh, folks like you who are journalists and academics, advocates, uh, people who can really put this uh, information to use. Uh, Center for Responsive Politics primarily focused on uh, federal campaign finance, uh, independent expenditures during the meteoric rise of IEs uh, after the Citizens United decision, and of course, federal lobbying. Uh, and NIMP uh, had been doing similar work at the state level uh, for state campaigns with campaign finance and independent expenditures and lobbying, uh, and both organizations dabbling in dark money and <clears throat> other uh, areas as possible. Uh, we're here primarily to talk about the integration of the lobbying database, uh, and I want to thank Omidyar Network for its support uh, helping us to, to get this information uh, together to, to, uh, to integrate the uh, federal and state lobbying, which is a huge lift uh, and really opens some doors uh, to analysis that hasn't been possible before. 
Uh, and to kind of go over that, I'll hand off to Dan to talk about federal lobbying and uh, past work there. Thanks. Uh, well, I'll start by kind of defining lobbying and talking about some of uh, the work that we've done at the federal level. Uh, the reporting required under the Lobbying Disclosure Act, which is where we get all of the federal level data that we're talking about today, is focused pretty tightly on actual contacts with government officials. So things like uh, grassroots lobbying, advertisements, and PR campaigns are generally not included in the federal lobbying reports. So we gather uh, these the data from the congressional disclosure offices via APIs, so it's machine readable and available on demand. Uh, and then we do our usual processes of cleaning it up, uh, connecting organizations and people with uh, name variations between filings, uh, and also doing some calculations so that we avoid any double counting due to quirks in the rules about who files and uh, what they file. Uh, and then once we have that stuff processed, you can find nearly all the information that is on those reports on opensecrets.org. Now, because the federal data is relatively accessible and uh, relatively robust in terms of what's reported, uh, they're telling us who is spending the money and how much, uh, who they hire, the actual individuals doing the lobbying, what issues they may be working on, uh, and even what parts of the government uh, have been targeted. So because of all that, we and many others have been able to do uh, some interesting research that uh, and we hope that in the future, similar things can uh, happen using the state data or a combined data set. Uh, so a couple of the things we've worked on over the last few years, uh, we did a collaboration with uh, Public Citizen where we looked at companies that got COVID-related uh, government contracts and we looked at their lobbying. We found that just 2% of the COVID contractors uh, both lobbied the White House or the agency that awarded them a contract and also reported lobbying on uh, specific COVID related issues. However, that 2% of companies received 37% of the money. We've also been able to track registered lobbyists through their careers and show that even when they drop off the official roles, uh, many are still working in government affairs, often for the same organizations, which is an indication that the universe of people uh, professionally trying to influence national policies is quite a bit bigger than the official reports may indicate. Uh, very recently, the USA Today used our uh, agency lobbying data to find that lobbying of the vice president's office jumped considerably during the Trump administration, so more organizations were lobbying the vice president and his staff uh, than we've seen in previous administrations. And those are just a few examples in addition to all the overall general trends we can look at uh, and spending by industries or organizations over the last 25 years um, that we are that are always available on the website and get updated just a, within a couple of days of a, a, a filing deadline every quarter. Uh, now, Brendan, do you want to talk a little bit about what uh, happens in state lobbying? Sure thing. Um, you know, state lobbying, as you expect, it's we're pretty much talking about some of the same sort of activity that, uh, you know, Dan's talking about on the federal level, except it's spread out over 50 state capitals. Um, you know, how each state defines what constitutes a lobbyist, what type of activities are allowed, um, what has to be reported is going to vary as with any state related activity. So some of the items that uh, Dan mentioned, you know, bill of identification, 
some grassroots lobbying, other activities are going to have unique rules depending on where you are. But you know, in the end, we you know you boil it down to lobbyists are being paid by their clients to advance their interests in the state legislatures, gubernatorial offices. Um, every state has its own system for registering and tracking who these people are. Um, so Open Secrets um, accesses that information uh, through either direct downloads of the data, or in many cases, we have uh, custom scripts that are designed to pull down the information off the web so that we can standardize it um, and make it all available in one place, uh, additionally, in a manner that links it up with our other existing data. Um, so you can view that on... Um, it's actually on the Follow the Money website. I'm going to drop a link um, in the chat. And that link is to um, the information on, includes some drop down menus where you can choose year, you can choose state, uh, client, lobbyist, and you can get those lists uh, for whichever, yeah, any of the 50 states. Um, so that information, we're able to create a uniform database. Um, across the board. Uh, aside from the client, uh, lobbyist client registration data, uh, the other important piece is reported data on lobbyist spending. Uh, but in this case, uh, there's some serious gaps in the data is not all states require a full reporting of uh, the spending data. Um, this is something I'll get into in some more detail when I talk about the uh, uh, scorecard later, but um, I'll also drop the uh, link to uh, the Follow the Money website that has the um, lobbying expenditure data as well, if you want to check that out. And I'll hand it off to Pete. Right, so this uh, variation in what's reported at the states has a significant impact uh, on our ability to um, to measure uh, lobbying efforts at the state level. Although there are some states where uh, very good information is reported. Um, there are also some states where very little is reported as Brendan mentioned. Um, Open Secrets uh, in its iteration as the Institute, uh, the National Institute on Money and Politics uh, the last few years had been collecting uh, state uh, lobbying registrations in all 50 states and spending in 19, um, but had not had the opportunity really to do a lot of um, research on uh, that spending uh, just through uh, various capacity uh, pieces. So uh, this uh, merger has been opening and the integration of the lobbying data has been opening uh, the doors here to finally uh, be able to do that. Uh, there is uh, a dearth of freely available um, research on, on state level lobbying and particularly on integrated federal and state level lobbying. Uh, so this is really exciting because of course, as, as we mentioned, uh, this is really the direct uh, effort to, to sway public policy. We certainly collect campaign contributions and the like, uh, independent expenditures, um, but really uh, in terms of uh, contributions from at least for-profit organizational interests, which we'll talk a little bit more about uh, coming up, uh, those contributions are really meant to pave the way uh, to have access uh, for, for lobbying. Uh, and so the lobbying is really the end goal here. Uh, and really uh, is important for us to be able to see and to, to measure. Uh, as uh, I'm going to hand off to Dan in just a moment to talk a little bit about uh, the reports, um, but there are links to the 2019 and 2020 report in the chat and also the 2021 report as well. Uh, so feel free to check those out. And those are also linked uh, in your uh, email uh, invitations as well. Uh, Dan, would you like to open up? So to start kind of with a, the big picture, um, to put it succinctly, lobbying has been quite strong in recent history. Uh, federal lobbying, uh, uh, where we have data going back to 1998, we can talk a little more about trends. Uh, there was close to a decade long decline in the 20, roughly the 20 teens that now seems to have leveled off and has been inching up since 2017. And that upward trend is even clearer in the 19 states where we have state spending data. Five of the last seven years saw increases in the lobbying totals, uh, and those totals went from 
uh, 1.76 billion in 2015 to just under 2 billion in 2021, while at the federal level totals went up from uh, 3.5 billion in 2015 to 3.7 billion in 2021. And those are all inflation adjusted numbers. N now note that all this money is not the only uh, political money and politics spending that's happening, it's not happening in a vacuum. Spending on elections has also been rising in some ways even more dramatically. Uh, there's been an explosion of small donors, small dollar donors, especially at the federal level. But political action committees, which are an apt comparison here for uh, the lobbying community because they are both similarly uh, heavily weighted towards <clears throat> uh, business or corporate interests. Uh, PAC spending, uh, at least contributions to candidates and parties, has risen by about $100 million in the last 10 years. And the, the reason that this is relevant to uh, the political contributions are relevant to a lobbying discussion is that one of their functions is to kind of grease the wheels when it's time to go in and lobby. But if we want to take a closer look at who is doing the lobbying, we found there's a lot of commonality at the sector level here. So this is like the top level industry uh, categories we have, of which there are about 13. Um, the top sectors are really pretty consistent both over time and at the two levels, the state and federal. Uh, health, finance and real estate, uh, miscellaneous business and energy and natural resources uh, are each spending considerably more on lobbying in state capitals and in Washington DC than other sectors like agribusiness or construction, for example. Um, <clears throat> The one difference really at the top, uh, among the top spenders, is that communications as a sector rises higher at the federal level and government entities tend to outperform at the, at the state level. So while health leads the sectors at both, in uh, both the state level and federal, uh, at the state level, entities like uh, cities and counties, uh, water and transportation districts, and some associations and types of government employees like sheriffs or uh, district attorneys who definitely lobby at the federal level, uh, often participating in the appropriations process to secure funding uh, even for specific projects, but they don't rise to be one of the top spenders the way they do at the state level, where they're the second biggest sector among the states that we have uh, spending information for. At the state level, those types of groups are lobbying about their budgets uh, coming from the state, including for specific agencies, but also for local needs like police work or health programs or sometimes around uh, issues about how states can regulate what local governments are able to do and how they operate. So states will sometimes limit what local governments can do, such as prohibiting them from banning fracking or uh, creating community-owned broadband, so internet infrastructure, um, or things like, uh, you know, immigration related sanctuary cities, so those types of issues. So those governments definitely have a big interest in lobbying the state that they're a part of. <clears throat> as far as uh, consistency of those top sectors within each state, we do usually see the top five populated uh, by those same groups I mentioned before, health, health sector, government entities, uh, finance, energy. There's some variation about where they fall when states have a very large uh, 
presence of a certain industry, such as energy being more dominant in Texas or California or finance in New York or maybe agriculture in a place like Iowa. But to return to the commonalities we see between state and federal, we decided to select uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing as kind of a case study to dig deeper on uh, and to try and illustrate how a group or industry undertakes lobbying across the country as a whole. So Pete, can you tell us more about the pharma pharmaceutical industry in particular? Yeah. So um, as Dan mentioned, the health sector broadly uh, leads the lobbying at the federal level and at the state level. Uh, and that is uh, generally true even from state to state with those variations that Dan mentioned. Um, within the health sector, of course, we have these subclassifications such as pharmaceuticals, uh, physicians, uh, and, and various other uh, subclassifications. Uh, at the federal level, uh, within the health sector, pharmaceuticals really do dominate the lobbying spending. Uh, for obvious reasons, um, the uh, at the state level, uh, pharmaceuticals are major contributors to the, the spending on lobbying from the health sector. Um, but the uh, the leading uh, classification within health is really uh, hospitals and nursing homes and healthcare institutions, uh, which are traditionally uh, regulated primarily at the state level. Of course, uh, I think that we will see an increase in pharmaceutical spending potentially uh, at the state level. Uh, however. Uh, because states are increasingly taking up measures to address uh, certain aspects of pharmaceutical regulation uh, in the absence of uh, federal movement on some of these issues. Uh, there are uh, situations or issues related to this, to pharmaceuticals, such as uh, how to address the opioid epidemic um, or um, uh, how, to, how to address rising drug costs. And that's what we really focused on was the drug pricing uh, in our case studies. In our um, examination of pharmaceutical spending. I'm going to do a quick share here. Um, the, the spenders overlapped uh, quite a bit. Uh, so uh, this isn't, just want to make sure you guys can see that. There we go. Uh, you guys see the table there? Dan, can I get a, yep. Uh, so uh, organizations appearing in the top 10 lists for federal uh, spending in the pharmaceutical sector uh, include pharma, of course, uh, which actually led uh, pharmaceutical spending unsurprisingly at both the federal and state levels. Um, but this is a table of the top 10 uh, pharmaceutical spenders at the federal level and the top 10 pharmaceutical spenders at the state level. We've got 15 organizations here. So there is a lot of overlap. Um, this is unsurprising. Uh, but informative, uh, what we see are the big pharmaceutical associations and companies. Uh, pharmaceuticals, of course, are an industry where companies tend to be rather large, uh, rather than being small companies spotted throughout the country that might be lobbying in specific states, um, regionally or something. Um, but also, and I'll get into this a little bit more in just a moment, um, pharmaceutical companies are coming into the states uh, to lobby for the same issues that they're lobbying about at the federal level uh, increasingly as states continue to take these issues up. Before I get into that, though, I want to talk about uh, who they're hiring. So uh, we found uh, this was true for pharmaceutical companies uh, and, and organizations, um, but also true across the board, uh, that organizations hire different firms to lobby at the federal level uh, than they do at the state level. And what we're seeing is that uh, the firms that they hire, uh, and I'm going to look at the pharmaceutical firms here, uh, these are the top firms hired uh, at the federal level um, by pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies in 2019 and 2020. Uh, we have here a who's who of, um, of lobbying firms, basically, a K Street list here. Uh, similarly, in 2021, uh, we had a, a list of the, uh, the major firms at the federal level as well. Uh, so this is very much hiring the best that there is. Uh, at the state level, uh, we see names that are less recognizable uh, from federal lobbying. What we're seeing is that uh, pharmaceutical organizations are hiring local firms to represent them in each state. Um, this is a list of the top 10 firms paid by pharmaceutical uh, industry to lobby at the state level, uh, just across the country. Uh, but what happens is, for example, 
we have Bay State, Bay State Strategies Group, which focuses on lobbying in Massachusetts. And so these organizations will hire uh, these local firms uh, in most cases. In some cases, they may also be represented by in-house lobbyists. So they'll have a vice president of public relations or something uh, actually travel to a state legislature to testify or submit written testimony. Um, but, but oftentimes they are hiring uh, firms and when they do, they tend to be local firms. There were a couple of examples of hiring uh, K Street firms to lobby at the state level, <clears throat> but they were pretty rare. Uh, so there isn't as much overlap in, in terms of who they're hiring. That said, uh, they are working on similar issues at the federal and state level and across the states. Uh, so the question then arises, how much does the messaging get impacted by who they're hiring and are they hiring lobbyists that specify or that specialize in pharmaceutical issues? The issues that we focused on uh, were drug list prices. Uh, this is the price that pharmaceutical manufacturers will put on a drug uh, to sell to intermediaries, such as pharmacy benefit managers or health insurance companies. Uh, there has traditionally been a uh, little transparency around what those initial list prices are. And they can vary quite a bit uh, from company to company and drug to drug. Uh, and sometimes they are sort of moved uh, upward uh, with then discounts for specific buyers. Uh, and so uh, there's been a lot of conversation about how much these list prices uh, affect the ultimate price for the consumer. Uh, pharmacy benefit managers or health insurance companies may get um, discounts on certain drugs um, as a specific buyer and may or may not have to pass that discount along uh, to the ultimate consumer uh, when you pick it up at the, at the pharmacy, for example. So we examined that in 2019 and 2020. Uh, in 2021, uh, we examined uh, bills looking at international reference rates. This is the idea that um, while drug costs are going up substantially in the United States, uh, they aren't going up as much in some of the other developed countries. Uh, and oftentimes we're looking at Canadian uh, provincial or national uh, drug prices uh, with these bills. Um, at the federal level, uh, and, and so uh, the issue here is that uh, there will be legislation to either um, cap drug prices at a certain percentage of uh, international drug prices uh, or to trigger some sort of a review of drug prices that exceed a certain percentage of international drug prices. At the federal level, both of these uh, are parts of HR3, the Lower Drug Costs Now Act. Uh, at the state level, uh, we have seen uh, several states consider bills looking at list prices for drugs, that pharmaceutical manufacturer initial price. Uh, and starting in 2021, uh, states really began to examine international reference rates. And so we examined that in 2021. Uh, what we have found uh, is that we looked at the testimony that the pharmaceutical companies and trade associations were submitting to the states on these bills. And these bills ultimately did very similar things, uh, just shining the light uh, on these drug prices and potentially capping them. Uh, and the testimony submitted by uh, these organizations was very similar uh, across the federal level and state level in the various states, regardless of who represented them. Uh, it looks like uh, hiring a local lobbyist is not necessarily hiring somebody that works or specializes specifically in an issue. Uh, the clients, the companies and trade associations very much are controlling that message. Uh, for example, uh, in uh, 2021, uh, we had testimony on international reference rates in Maine and North Dakota. Uh, these were uh, submitted by uh, an internal lobbyist in one case, uh, and an external lobbyist in another. Uh, so um, Maine's bill, LD 1636, required the Maine Health Data Organization to compare the prices of some of the most expensive drugs in the state to Canadian prices and determine what cost savings would result if the prices for those drugs in Maine matched the lowest provincial price. Uh, the bill required the Maine Health Data Organization to publish a report annually uh, outlining those potential savings and submit the report to the legislature to inform potential legislative action on drug prices. Um, North Dakota's Senate Bill 2170 uh, would have used Canadian prices as reference points for some of the most expensive drugs in that state uh, and Im implemented drug pricing negotiations between the state and pharmaceutical manufacturers based on those reference rates. So pretty similar. Uh, and uh, in uh, we had, uh, as I mentioned, uh, an in-house lobbyist in Maine uh, lobbying on the 
on the bill there. In North Dakota, uh, these organizations, particularly pharma, hired locally uh, a lobbyist named Peter Fieldstead, uh, who is registered to lobby in Minnesota, oddly, uh, rather than North Dakota, but uh, hired the firm there, had him travel over to North Dakota and uh, testify and also submit some written testimony. Uh, but the testimony uh, was almost identical in many cases. So for example, um, this is uh, multiple pages of testimony uh, that overlaps quite a bit. Up front here, we have uh, this title, for example, uh, and the exact same title uh, in the other state in Maine, so, uh, or in North Dakota. Basically, they just are plugging in a different bill number. Uh, and this was really uh, a visual representation of how similar the testimony is from state to state. Um, but we saw this uh, in many cases, particularly, uh, or including in uh, verbal testimony, which we found by looking up uh, recordings of uh, committee hearings and then four hearings and so forth. Um, the similarity of the testimony, uh, as I mentioned, uh, does reflect that who you hire is really not uh, reliant on their expertise on the issue in particular necessarily, um, but really reflects hiring local firms that have good relationships uh, or close relationships with legislators in each state and expertise about the legislative policymaking processes in each state. Uh, this um, raises questions about uh, potentially doing some additional research in the future, as, as I'll get into a little bit more later, uh, about revolving door stuff. So Dan was mentioning that we've done quite a bit of that at the federal level. Uh, doing that at the state level uh, may be very informative as well. Uh, the predictability of this testimony also lends itself to um, advocates uh, to potentially be better prepared for uh, some of the debates that happen in their local legislatures. Um, we can tell what some of the testimony is going to be uh, from pharmaceutical companies, for example. Uh, this is unlikely to be unique to pharmaceutical companies. Uh, people working in other spheres should be able to benefit from something like this as well. Um, all of this is uh, available for us because some states are making this testimony publicly available. Not all states do that, um, and not all states make how much money is being spent on these bills or spent in general, um, particularly uh, easy to access or necessarily even reported. Uh, so I want to hand off to Brendan to talk a little bit more about those disclosure practices. Um, these are so critical to being able to actually measure uh, the efforts to impact public policy here um, in in useful ways for journalists, for academics looking at large scale trends and for advocates who are trying to work on specific issues. Brendan. Great, <clears throat> thanks Pete. Um, so, you know, while as, uh, while Pete and Dan have been analyzing this available data, I've been working on looking at where is this data coming from? How is it disclosed? And, you know, and through this, we've come up with this uh, uh, scorecard uh, ranking all the states. Um, I'm going to drop, a, I'll drop a link to, I'm going to do, do a little sh share screen so you can see some of what we're working on here. And I'm going to drop a link to the report in the chat, which has uh, just been uh, put up today. Um, so it's hot off the presses, so to speak. Um, but as far as, you know, open secrets, what we decided we wanted to create this scorecard uh, of state level lobbying disclosure, really in order to uh, one, well, let people know how varied state level disclosure is and then show people you know, where the gaps and issues are in these state laws, which are uh, you know, causing problems uh, as far as being able to uh, represent what lobbying looks like in total uh, across the country. And then um, <clears throat> you know, following up on that, hopefully we can uh, get a conversation started about uh, best practices uh, going forward. So let's, uh, I'm gonna do, set up the screen share here. Give me one moment. Everybody else should be able to see the map now and Okay, so this is just a little visual representation of what we've done. 
Um, the the uh, when you see the whole report, uh, it'll get into the details and be able to look at it uh, state by state. But what I have here is in this map we've uh, shows we've uh, assigned scores to each state based on several different topics. You can see here as I uh, roll over them, it shows you what uh, total score is and what the break breakdowns are. Um, so how we put this together is focused on four categories. Um, the top category, most important category is compensation. Um, what the client is paying the lobbyist to represent them on whatever issues. Um, whether or not this is reported is the biggest factor in evaluating a state's disclosure regime. Um, without this, we really don't know how much money is being spent. Um, so in our scoring, compensation is the category that's weighted, uh, high, weighted the most in the scoring. Um, and just to, as an example to drive home this point, why uh, compensation really sort of make or break in this. Uh, in 2021, in the 19 states that Open Secrets has uh, tracked on the website, 84% um, of the lobbying expenditures that we tracked were attributed to comp compensation. So obviously, if we don't have this, then you're just you're missing basically, you know, almost everything. Um, so second category. Um, identification of the actors, the lobbyists and the clients. Um, so as I talked about earlier, we collect this registration information on lobbyists and clients in all 50 states. Um, what we focused on in particular uh, in this area was client registration. Um, 30 states, the client and the uh, lobbyist uh, must register separately. Um, versus in the other states, lobbyist is responsible for identifying the client in their reports. Um, with this separate registration, um, with a separate registration as the 30 states have, um, you're going to get more accurate data coming in on the clients. And the states can also have the ability then to require more detailed information from the clients than what could be asked for from just the lobbyist who really probably only has information uh, about the client that's relevant to his, uh, their particular uh, contract. Um, so uh, as far as the, in this area, we scored the uh, states that had separate registrations uh, got a higher score. Um, third category, timely reporting. Um, Filing between two and four times a year is the most common schedule that uh, we see in the states. Um, although some, you know, go as far as only once a year, that's uh, very rare. But it, there is uh, ones out there that we uh, states that have only once a year uh, reporting. But uh, 16 states do require some form of monthly reporting. That's uh, most often is tied to the legislative session. Um, so. Um, they may have to report monthly while the legislature is in session and then quarterly when it's not something along those lines there's you know various uh, ways of implementing that but uh, something like this really enables more timely release of information uh, to the public um, so uh, states that have some version of this uh, were the states that received the best scores uh, on timely reporting um, Fourth and final category, uh, user-friendly access. Um, this has to do with the, the state's disclosure websites. Um, what is required to be disclosed on forms, right, is just part of the whole disclosure structure. And if the data collected by the state is then not made available to the public in some sort of usable format, uh, the whole process can be you know, close to a futile exercise. <clears throat> So we broke this category into three parts and we evaluated each state's disclosure website by uh, one, search functionality, um, two, accessible lists of lobbyists and clients, um, and availability of downloadable data. And, you know, these seems like these are fairly simple, um, you know, uh, things to look out for, but even just 
having a straightforward list of who are the lobbyists and who are the clients in that state for the year or perhaps that session um, are things that are not always, um, you know, they're not always easily accessible uh, on these sites. Um, so it's actually something that, you know, it <clears throat> varied uh, scores were very varied on that. So some of these simple things um, are not always there. And uh, so those are the, uh, the four categories that we uh, we broke it down by. Um, so really what is the, the takeaway from this um, is, you know, we found a lot of gaps that need to be filled if we really want to have a full picture of lobbying activity across the country. Um, really like most crucially, uh, you know, the lack of compensation reporting in many states means we don't know how much money is being spent. Um, I'll break that down a little bit. Uh, we talked a little bit about the numbers. So just to be clear, we collect data on 19 states. They report compensation and then also re uh, make that data available in such a way that we can uh, access it and provide it in a comparable manner. Um, but there are actually 26 states that require compensation reporting. So there's seven of those states where um, the uh, the disclosure of that data makes it difficult for us or has made it unable for us to uh, you know include that in our data set. Um, there's seven states that have partial um, reporting. That may be uh, reporting, they only have to report in a range, say between 10 and 20,000 or 20 and 40,000 um, dollars. or they may just report a lump sum that uh, the client may have to file a report and say, we spent $40,000 this quarter on lobbying and they don't have to necessarily, uh, they definitely don't have to assign that to any particular lobbyists or you know, say essentially what exactly that went to. And then finally we have 17 states that where um, it's simply just not required at all. Um, So that's our big takeaway. And, and I just like to add when you, you to link this up with what Pete was telling us about, you're talking about uh, like national uh, nationalized lobbying efforts with groups like pharma that are coordinating uh, these things. You know, knowing the full extent of these campaigns across the country, you know, it relies on us getting uh, better disclosure. Um, and so it's not just an exercise in saying, oh, we want to have a, you know, know the total number, the total amount of money spent. We really, to, in order to be able to, you know, get better analysis to, to know um, what's really going on across the country, um, having fuller disclosure is really going to help. Um, so, you know, in the end, uh, what this? What about going forward for us for this for looking at lobbying? There's you know, some new areas that we'd like to be able to explore. Hopefully, going forward, looking at um, rules on bill identification is one specific area where uh, we can uh, do a little more. That's pretty limited in in states. Some have full bill identification. Others, it's mere. They don't have any, or maybe it's merely. Um, a checkbox of some categories that um, are being lobbied on, some generic categories. Um, so that's not something that we really uh, uh, used in the uh, scorecard, but it's something we might uh, explore more later. Um, just and lastly, to sort of wrap it up, we, you know, we'd really like to be able to going forward uh, reach out to folks at state level, different stakeholders. Uh, and be able to get some feedback on potential best practices, which would ideally, you know, lead to work towards developing some sort of common framework for state lobbying disclosure. Um, but that would be, you know, uh, off in the future, things that we would like to be able to, uh, to do. Um, I think I'm going to pass it on to Pete at this point, and I think, and then I will drop the link to the uh, full report into the uh, into the chat. Thanks, Brendan. And ultimately, uh, what we hope to accomplish uh, is identify 
additional states where we can start getting uh, some of the spending data. So as Brendan mentioned, we have this data in 19 states currently. Um, there are additional states that have had compensation reporting but have not made that information very available. Uh, I'm thinking of one in particular that I don't want to shame because they have since uh, put this online. Um, but the last time we did one of these assessments was in the mid 2010s. Um, when we were examining which states we could get data in and uh, we had an example of a state where uh, really good data was reported in terms of how much money is being spent on lobbying, who's getting paid and who's paying whom. Um, but the, the reports were on paper and just put in a filing cabinet in the state capital and the response from the state was somebody has to come make copies of it if they want it uh, and that sort of thing. So that really puts a, <laughs> a dampening on our efforts to get this data uh, and digitize it uh, and make it available for folks. Um, but states are continually improving their technology. Uh, so hopefully there is some uh, opportunity here to expand our data collection. Uh, and uh, hopefully in the long term, we can see some legislative action or administrative rule action increasing uh, what is the quality and the amount of what is reported. So, uh, next steps for us on a broad scale uh, are further integration of our lobbying data and uh, development of web tools. Uh, so we're, we're in the process of migrating uh, our database from the followthemoney.org website to the opensecrets.org website. And we've seen some, uh, some of that happen with the campaign finance data uh, and the lobbying data is happening in the background where we have done a lot of organizational matching and some matching of lobbyists, um, but need to uh, develop that into to web tools. And uh, we may be, uh, we, we were interviewing uh, some folks here on this call about uh, what database structure uh, might look like and what web tools might look like. And we may be, uh, as we continue that process, uh, you can expect us to reach out to some of you again um, or, or new folks to get more feedback on that uh, this fall. Uh, research opportunities here abound, uh, of course. Uh, a couple of things that come up right away uh, in my mind are uh, things like broader measurements of industry spending correlations with their win-loss rates on legislation. Um, if we can either get a database or, or partner with somebody about um, legislative outcomes. And there are organizations that are working to try to measure that sort of thing, at least in specific issue areas. Uh, so uh, being able to do that um, would be informative about which industries are actually the most powerful in influencing public policy. Um, looking at, uh, as I mentioned earlier, national organizations are often uh, taking advantage of local expertise and relationships um, when hiring firms. Uh, so this op opens the opportunity for a widespread revolving door analysis of state lobbying and governance um, that is currently absent uh, and many other opportunities as well. Uh, I wanna thank the Omidia Network again uh, for its support in our work trying to get this federal and state lobbying data integrated and opening up these opportunities for this research uh, and uh, for examining where opportunities uh, may exist to increase the amount of data that we are able to collect. Um, this really makes this possible. Uh, and I, um, I'm going to throw this to a Q&A, uh, uh, and Dan is reviewing the chat there to, to look for any questions. Um, but I do also want to ask folks, um, please feel free to jump in either now or uh, again in the chat, uh, or later you can reach out to us about any particular kinds of analysis or tools you'd like to see uh, that can help inform our integration work. So Dan, I'll kick it over to you. Sure. Um, again, I encourage people to add questions, but we do have a couple here. Um, so if the next, someone suggests that the next step is to compare candidate contributions to the themes of sponsored state legislation and the tenor of lobbying communications from those donors to the candidates, uh, are, do Pete or Brendan, do you have any thoughts on that? And I'll, I would jump in to say uh, at, the f at the federal level, one of the um, things we don't get a lot of information about is for people lobbying Congress, they just have to say they lobbied the House or the Senate and almost all of them say both. Uh, so we don't get any information about member offices or committees that they're lobbying. Uh, so additional analysis could help fill that gap by looking at uh, you know, companies lobbying on an issue 
and then take a look at who that same company is uh, giving money to uh, in terms of politicians to get at least a theoretical list of people they might be targeting. So that's something that uh, could be done at the federal level. But uh, Pete, do you have any ideas or thoughts about that concept at the state level? Yeah, I love this question uh, because of the uh, really um, uh, the, the, the campaign contributions and the lobbying really are an integrated effort uh, to, to get access to and influence public policy. Um, uh, both uh, the Center for Responsive Politics and the National Institute on Money and Politics did a great job of uh, tying those data sets together in terms of uh, assigning IDs, uh, this is a little wonky, but assigning IDs to uh, the clients that were lobbying at the federal level or at the state level and their um, their actions in making campaign contributions, which sounds easier than it really is uh, because those disclosures um, don't often have standardized names and so forth. Uh, so uh, campaigns will report pretty much anything as a contributor name. Uh, we have almost 2,000 different variations of AT&T uh, in the Follow the Money database, for example. Uh, so actually normalizing all that is a big lift, but something that both organizations have been working towards for decades and doing a good job of. That really opens up this kind of opportunity uh, to look at wide scale um, efforts by specific groups or industries uh, with their campaign contributions and legislative efforts. Uh, I like this um, opportunity. Uh, the testimony right now is hard for us to get. Um, we, we did actually watch videos of testimony for, uh, for these reports uh, where those are available and, and the like. Um, but to the extent that we can build uh, kind of a database of that sort of thing uh, would be very helpful uh, for for getting into the tone of, uh, of lobbying. Uh, and there have been efforts by other groups over the years off and on to try to do something like this. So I think it is becoming technically more feasible, uh, even with video um, testimony uh, and machine transcripting and searching stuff. So. I would uh, say <clears throat> about the issue of the, you know, the lobbyists uh, making candidate contributions. I think, um, you know, there, there's, it's something to look at uh, at the uh, state level in that um, now obviously some states have there's different uh, laws on whether lobbyists can make contributions or maybe sometimes you know can they make contributions during the legislative session you know but then they can they can't do it then but they can do it later so there's uh, different rules in that but when you look at the issue of contribution limits, you know, where in some states there's very high or no contribution limits at all, then the uh, idea of uh, lobbyists making, you know, extremely large contributions uh, can, can be an issue. Um, so that would, depends on what the lobbyist laws are, uh, lobbyist contribution laws are in each state, but uh, that is information that actually we do have in our laws database. And just to be sure that everybody is aware of it, there is never any limitation on how much money you can spend on lobbying. And that is always uncapped. And there's a follow-up comment here, noting that the same corporate teams make decisions on disbursements for lobbying and campaign contributions. That is certainly true uh, and not a secret, at least at the federal level, that often the lobbying team or you know the vice president of government affairs for the company is literally running the pack and making decisions on who gets contributions from the company's pack a, a great example that i like to point to um, that really highlights how these campaign contributions are meant to draw or, or to facilitate access to public officials um, is that at the state level where most of my expertise has been uh, the biggest donor that we have across the country in our database is AT&T, uh, and it gives almost exactly equally uh, to Republican and Democratic candidates, uh, but it gives about 95% of its money to incumbents. Uh, what it's doing is giving money to people who are sitting in office making decisions, and they're also likely to win re-election incumbents win uh, 90 to 95% of the time in legislative elections, um, and so this is uh, just an investment, really. Uh, that that is true generally of uh, for-profit at least uh, uh, organizational contributions it's different for individuals and, and other uh, sources ideological uh, groups and so forth but but for uh, company interests whether through their PACs or at the state level where they can often make contributions directly from their treasuries um, it is very much meant to pave the way to lobbying which again emphasizes just how important uh, that access to public officials is and how important it is to be able to measure it 
Uh, there's also a question about the list price data. Uh, was there a particular source for that? Yeah, so uh, there was an organization, uh, I should have their uh, name in my head, but I can't remember it right off the top of my head. Um, there was a, I found a, an organization that put together some information about um, health related and, and particularly pharmaceutical related uh, legislation at the state level. Uh, I will pull that up and drop a link in the chat here in just a moment. Uh, that is really helpful for us. Obviously we have um, information about some of the bills in Congress and at the state level, um, but classifying them is a, is a big lift. And currently we need to rely on groups that are working oftentimes in specific issue areas or in geographic areas, such as in a state uh, for that kind of information. States don't typically do that very well. Well, I think we have just a minute or two left. Uh, I did want to ask Brendan if uh, if any, while working on the scorecard, if uh, any particular states jumped out, you know, is there one that really stands out as very good or very bad? Or if there are any strange situations where the information they report is extensive, but it's really hard for the public to get to it, or uh, just any notable States yeah, no, I think across. I can show real quick one. Um, all right. Where's my link here? I'm going to open this up and, uh, and share this. You know, one, I talked a little bit about, um, you know, state disclosure websites and, um, and what I can show is, here it is. Uh, you know, one I consider to be a really good example. Um, this is uh, Washington State's uh, website. And, um, you know, what I really like about this, it has um, one, you have, it has different, uh, you have your different areas, you're your lobbyist, lobbyist reporting, clients, and public agency lobbying, which is something that uh, Dan spoke to a little bit earlier. Um, so you can easily jump between these different categories. When you open the page, it automatically populates. Uh, you don't have to do a search. It just automatically gives you a list of all the lobbyists. And right here, you can easily just download that at any time. You can be like, all right, I'm going to take this list and download it. You know, you can, you can choose. You can break it down by year to try to trim down the list. So here I just said, oh, just give me 2021. Even if, and it has real time um search results so if i just uh type in aa it actually starts it creates the search before i even hit enter um so this is a site that i really like like i said you can it provides uh, a download uh, one more nice piece about this if i click on lobbyist reporting auto populates right in there it shows the uh the expenses number the compensation numbers so it's right there. You don't have to go digging for it. If you're interested in who's who's making the most money, um, you can bring it right up. Um, so that's a pretty a good example of uh, of a state disclosure website that really makes the data uh, easily accessible to anyone, whether you're just a regular person or you're whether you're a journalist or a data nerd like us who are just who want to grab everything. So we are at time here. Uh, I will note that the organization's name that I was trying to come up with was the uh, National Academy for State Health Policy. I dropped a link to their legislative tracker uh, in the chat if folks are interested in checking that out. Um, thank you again, everyone, for coming. We're really excited about this. This is just an introductory uh, look at the federal and state legislation or federal and state lobbying. Um, we're really excited to, to do a lot more with this. Uh, having this door opening uh, is very, valuable for all the reasons that we discussed. Um, this is so important to public access you know, for journalists and academics and advocates alike, uh, and just the general public too. So, um, looking forward to more uh, and more conversations. So, thank you all. And take care. Thank you. Thanks, Pete.